Hello and welcome to day two of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, um, 65th session. And here is the youth perspective on everything that's happened so far today. Hey everyone, I'm Carolina and I attended today the side event called Leaving No One Behind, the rights-based and development-oriented approach of the European Union to drug policies in cooperation initiatives in Central Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean. This side event addressed addiction problems from a public health perspective based on science and knowledge and gender perspective also. They focus on people, respect for human rights and proportionality of the penalty. Basically, they uh, explain what are the COPOLAT and the CADAP projects in Latin America and also in Central Asia. The COPOLAT is a cooperation program between Latin America and the European Union, which is known in its third phase. Sorry. <laughs> New complex context post COVID, which accumulates with other issues that came from before and affects social cohesion as well. The political debate between the EU and the CELAC, leaving no one behind, is very important for them. The specific objectives are to promote sustainable development and inclusion, social development for populations, and improve living standards for citizens. This is what, uh, for example, Germany's input on Latin America and Central Asia was about. Italy talk uh, as well in this side event and they demand uh, the control and balance between supply and demand. Also, uh, the word from Paraguay was heard and they explained a little bit about the vision of Latin America between the coordination from the European Union and the CELAC. And the representative from Paraguay talked about the tools and support needed to fight the global drug problem, sorry, with an uh, analytic approach. Also, uh, people from Spain, they uh, explained a little bit more about the CAPAD project, which is a, a project, sorry, <laughs> that it's between uh, February 2021 to February 2024 and 6.8 million euros were founded by the European Union to Central European countries on the heroin route. This afternoon I attended a side event hosted by the government of Slovenia uh, entitled Early Prevention Development of a New Paradigm. So this side event was about very uh, early life interventions, pre-adolescent interventions predominantly, uh, so very young children. And it was predominantly discussing sort of the more technical details of the programs that were being implemented in a number of countries, Slovenia, uh, Bosnia and Serbia, to name three. There was also a speaker from the UNODC Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilita Re Rehabilitation section. The speakers, like I said, their content was generally quite dry. It was very technical um, and discussed sort of the yes, minute details of implementing such programs. Uh, very little was discussed about the actual content of the programs or the impact of them. Uh, but all speakers claimed that this sort of represents a new paradigm, a shift in early prevention. Uh, from what I saw at this side event, I can't really say that that is true. Um, the interventions were extremely focused on school settings and the family. Um, there was a speaker from Bosnia who discussed the Strong Families program um, as a yeah a program of early intervention uh, in preventive education in Bosnia. All of these programs uh, fail to consider young people who maybe fall between the cracks uh, of these systems. They leave education, they don't have a strong family, um, maybe they don't have a family structure at all. And all of this sounds distinctly similar to the previous paradigms of early prevention education. Uh, the previous paradigms which we know haven't worked and we now leave behind communities of young people who are forgotten about within society, who drop out of education early, who don't have a family, uh, the more vulnerable young people in our society. 
Will this lead to a significant change in the impact of these uh, early prevention programs? That remains to be seen. As I said, there was no discussion of this in the side event, um, but I think it is unlikely based off of the target groups and the um, structure that they're using for these early intervention programs. So the first event that I attended today um, was called Preventative Drug Education Adapting to the COVID-19 Pandemic. So it was run by the Singapore government. Um, I didn't really have much um, backing, backup reading done for this side event. Um, and when I entered it, I realized it was um, very much on the, uh, as the title expresses, prevention side of things. Um, they talked about mostly youth um, and how we need to protect youth from drug use and um, all things prevention, only looking at what to do before um, someone uses drugs. And it involved things like um, pledges, um, student pledges of hashtag no drugs at all, um, the, an app that they created called Drug Buster Buddies, things like that. So it was, um, it was a frustrating event um, to listen to, just um, knowing that they were talking about, they use the words drug abuser a lot. They didn't use people who use drugs, which is even used at the UN level. Um, so punitive language throughout. Um, they also talked about how uh, there's a problem because there's like so many young people being arrested for drug use, but not at all looking at the issue of um, reforming the laws that put them in jail in the first place. Um, seen as the, the there isn't a reduction in drug use it's actually increasing and um yeah the approach the approach was frustrating to listen to but also interesting to hear um the kind of approaches taken by the prevention side of things um although um although not evidence based so the second side event that i have attended today um was called the green wave hits europe um, it was an event run by ID, IDPC, Transform, WOLA, um, and a range of other drug policy reform and cannabis reform organizations. It was um, quite a nice change from the first event that I attended. Um, it was interesting to hear about basically the reforms happening in Europe right now. Either they've gone through and passed as legislation or they are in the works. So um, firstly, someone came and talked about Malta and Malta's new legislation is about the regulation of cannabis. It's basically a mix between depenalization, decriminalization and criminalization because uh, police still have the right to um, arrest if they're suspicious of trafficking, which brings along some, some trickiness. Um, and they said that they're right now really ironing out the details and what it means for the law in practice and what it says in writing. The key criticisms um, by the speaker from Malta was that the uh, there is a serious lack of social equity approach to remedy the wrongdoings of the past of this criminalization, um, and that if there is there to be if there is to ever be speaker um, talked about the other reforms that are in the works at the moment in Europe, um, such as in Germany, Luxembourg, Spain, and Italy. The most interesting part of this event for me was when um, Tom Blickman spoke about how um, the laws, the conventions within the UN and the EU um, work against these reforms that the um, European countries are now um, starting to move towards. He spoke about how um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, is a blatant example of the need for compliance with international law um, and even though Russia is condemning other countries for not following international law in terms of drug policies um, they themselves also aren't. This crisis right now really highlights the um, importance of international law and how fragile it is and so that's the where he came from when he was framing um, his argument of how we need to find ways to reform without just ignoring international law which was something interesting for someone um, a young person in drug policy reform as myself um, trying to navigate this world of conventions and um, reforms and people and activism but within um, international conventions can be quite difficult. He explained that there were several options um, for creating reform and change in the international conventions. 
The first is to uh, amend the conventions, which he stated would be a diplomatic nightmare. The second is to withdraw from conventions, um, which would be damaging to your country as you can't uh, exclude you from some trade agreements and uh, you can't then be in the EU anymore as you must be compliant with the international conventions of the UN to be in the EU. The third option, he said, was the one that he elaborated on as being the um, the best way he can see forward of um, withdrawing and reaccession to the convention with a reservation, as Bolivia did when it came to coca leaves. In Bolivia's case, um, 18 countries went against um, Bolivia's reaccession uh, with the with the reservation, uh, but this was far from the 62 votes that were needed to stop Bolivia from joining. So that is how they made some change. Um, to international law. I found this event to be quite interesting. Um, I really liked hearing about how to work within the international conventions and what we can ask our governments to be doing um, and while still uh, complying with the international conventions. Um, it was a new concept to me so I felt like I, I gained a lot from the um, from the conversation and they didn't they didn't talk about youth in any way the only time that youth came up was when they spoke about how the countries that are moving towards in Europe um, cannabis reform they are only ever talking about adult youth um, which still leaves leaves us um, or the younger people um, below 18 behind in um, in reforms in Europe Indy, uh, I attended um two very insightful sessions. Uh, the first one was legalizing the drug wars, uh, which was a regulatory history of UN drug control uh, and a book review uh, and discussion by John Collins, the author himself of uh, the book. This uh, book talks about how the, uh, the world uh, understands uh, war on drugs right now uh, is, is different from the, the actual reality. Uh, the author debunks a lot of facts related to war on drugs of, of treaties uh, being uh, a new colonial construct or international opium control, uh, uh, seeing prohibition and uh, regulation as a anti-colonial uh, endeavor. And lastly, the system enforces prohibition on the member states. Uh, so myths like these were debunked and uh, uh, talked in detail about. Um, then the author uh, talked about the multilateral uh, drug control that, uh, which originated at the turn of 20th century to manage uh, overproduction and uh, uh, spillovers of uh, over cultivation. Um, and it led to a lot of questions uh, related to conventions and how did a single convention gain uh, such a hegemony or um, what comes next in the debate versus, uh, uh, debate of pluralist versus integrationist. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the author and the ambassadors agreed upon uh, uh, ad adopting evidence-based approach for better um, uh, designing their drug policies. Uh, this was the whole idea of uh, bringing to the table new approaches rather than learning uh, uh, iso in isolation uh, uh, when you uh, develop uh, um, uh, and the, the talk ended uh, with the conclusion that there is a need to develop um, evidence based approach at local level and regional levels. Today, I attended a side event hosted by the Singapore Anti-Narcotics Association entitled Understanding the Struggles and Successes of Female Substance Abusers in Their Recovery Journey. So as you can tell by the title and the organisers of this side event, it was focused uh, solely on abstinence, uh, solely on treatment of drug use disorders uh, and treatment centres in East Asia specifically. So. Singapore, uh, the Singapore Anti-Narcotics Association, uh, they had a speaker who, along with the rest of the speakers, co-opted quite a lot of progressive language around the social factors which impact uh, women's drug use and how they interact with services. This includes things like stigma and discrimination, marginalization, uh, experiences of 
trauma in childhood um, as well as a women's role in sort of society, the family uh, and the home. So yeah, there was a lot of progressive language which I felt was sort of disguising the, the nature of the work that they are doing. Um, and they also made a lot of claims which uh, were either very difficult to verify or untrue, I would say. So they claimed that um, prison promotes desistance from uh, drug use and other forms of criminality. Uh, statistically, that's that's just not true. And they also claim that after prison, uh, women are more likely to find better partners who do not promote criminality. Uh, this claim is, is obviously very difficult to verify, but uh, I think it indicates um, the view that the women who use drugs do not have any autonomy over the criminality or over the drug use or um, yeah, why they are using drugs and it's solely down to sort of manipulative partners. A uh, speaker from Macau also claimed that uh, women who have had abortions, um, that impacts on their interaction with services. Uh, I asked for some proof about this. They claimed that it has a lasting negative impact on uh, the health of women. Um, again, I, I don't think that's true. Uh, they said that this was anecdotal evidence from their centre, uh, which again may be true, but is also possibly hiding the situation this this woman or these women found themselves in, uh, maybe around the laws around abortion in Macau, the um, safety of getting an abortion in Macau. These kind of uh, impacts were not mentioned. It was just that abortion can cause long-term negative health impacts and impact drug use. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of unusual uh, language and claims used in this side event. Uh, I often quite like going to these side events um, and trying to yeah, raise some of these concerns because often they just say these things and uh, there's no one to yeah, contradict this or question it or ask for some evidence, uh, which yeah, they didn't manage to provide. Day two at CND, uh, I attended the side event titled uh, Promoting a Public Health Approach in Addressing and uh, Countering the World Drug Problems, which was organized by WHO, on which the panelist uh, Devorah Cashel, Director of uh, Department uh, of uh, Mental Health and Substance Use for WHO, presented its work for improving access to controlled medicines, where it talked about the process of revising uh, the guidelines for access to and uh, safe use of controlled medicines, which is uh, expected to be completed in 2022. Uh, she also uh, provided uh, an update regarding uh, addressing prevention and management of drug use and drug use disorders. Uh, she talked about the disruptions of services for people Mm, with substance use disorders from 2020 till 2022, showing a figure of uh, complete and partial disruptions. It also talks about Stop Overdose Safely SOS project implemented uh, jointly with UNODC uh, from 2016 to 2021 in Central Asia with uh, 14,000 naloxone kits purchased and distributed. And if I have to uh, talk about my country, then very less service providers having naloxone in hand knows how to use it. Yeah, the side event talked about the need for scaling up uh, activities to effectively... Uh I attended uh, was links between drugs and the environment. And uh, this was majorly uh, on the, the fact that when uh, people see drug use, they <clears throat> take into account psychology, they take into account the social factors um, related to drug use and the legal factors and uh, health factors. But one completely fails to see uh, how it is being uh, impacting the environment. Uh, and there's, uh, there's always a possibility if, uh, if, if uh, the methods which one you is using to use a substance uh, uh, is eventually producing this um, uh, 
waste which is not being treated properly uh, maybe for some of uh, us uh, some of us uh, we we might have facilities to dispose of uh, in uh, needle and syringe and uh, whatever methods people have been using to consume uh, drugs uh, but these can be categorized into different uh, areas like uh, they could be solvents they could be aqueous components like acid uh, acid or bases which which is all obviously used in some of the substances and uh, how these uh, byproducts uh, remain biologically active and impact uh, and might impact with the marine life or uh, might have different environmental effects uh, so this uh, div uh, this whole session was around uh, the 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 geography uh, the the environment that is being uh, impacted by uh, drug use uh, especially uh, in terms of waste because most of the time waste disposal disposal uh, or or waste is not treated properly in in a lot of scenarios so being from third world nation i have seen how uh, one can be poor in terms of treating uh, their waste and i i value uh, the opinion if, uh, if if there is a way to reduce uh, harms on the environment while also dealing with other harms related to drug use uh, could be a commendable <clears throat> way to move forward with harm reduction thank you In the plenary today, uh, there was a lot of disruption caused by an intervention made by the Russian Federation where they attempted to postpone one of the agenda items to the reconvened session uh, of CND in December. There was a lot of confusion about why they were doing this uh, and what exactly they were proposing uh, from the majority of attendees, including the chair. And the delegate from the Russian delegation could be seen sort of smiling uh, to his colleagues in the background while this was all being discussed. There's no clear idea as to what they were trying to do, except for derail the international processes uh, and the work of the Commission. Perhaps in response to some of the statements which were made yesterday and today, uh, and will likely continue to be made further into the week, condemning Russian imperialism and condemning the war in Ukraine. Before this disruption was caused, uh, there were two in particular statements made that I would like to touch on. One by Germany, uh, the country where I live. So Germany uh, recently elected a new government um, who have announced plans to transform the drug policy a little bit, uh, including the legalization of cannabis. And their statement was partly in line with this, uh, talk about the need for harm reduction, the importance of naloxone uh, as a life-saving harm reduction tool. And they also very briefly discussed their, their plans for the new cannabis policy, uh, just saying it would be based on harm reduction. Um, what exactly this means is, is unclear and what exactly the legal market for cannabis in Germany might look like once implemented uh, also remains unclear off the back of this statement. They also touched on uh, some other issues, including saying that we need to tackle the root causes of the global drug problem from all angles and referencing the environmental destruction caused by drug cultivation and production. Uh, this is in line with a lot of the work that Germany has done in particular, uh, along with a number of other countries at CND in, in recent years and including this year. What they failed to mention in this um, statement when they were discussing the environmental destruction was a lot of the destruction is caused by policies attempting to destroy drug cultivation and drug production. The indiscriminate spraying of chemicals across wide areas in order to kill illicit crops causes massive damage to ecosystems, in particular in Latin America, uh, but across the world. And there was no reference to this at all by the German state. The Global Fund also made a statement uh, where they touched on the need to expand the reach and quality 
of harm reduction, HIV and TB related services. They stressed that people who use drugs can play a key role in developing these services and that the involvement of people who use drugs and community led responses demand our attention and support. They discussed uh, the high risk environment of prisons and the harm that criminalization causes to people who use drugs and their health outcomes. They referenced the harm caused by criminalization but do not explicitly call for decrim. Um, and they also discussed their upcoming replenishment and targeted a $18 billion uh, funding replenishment this year, uh, which would be fantastic to see. And it is vitally important that some of this money goes towards these community-led harm reduction services that were mentioned in this statement.